about it. Hey, everyone. Hey, so greetings from Hawaii and uh, Nukulevu. Nakavinaka <laughs> Yeah, kila na bunifu sisi mati kumikini ngo na nando bulangi, o Suzy Shaw, my nukulevu, o kila ni bivi na kivu na katoka, ena kivu na kuku. Mendo ba kumbola sarumanda, kivu na nando maramu bula ni dokai, ena sinu na kani kuwa sinu tambo, na ika sinu katolo ni sinu ni bula mati, rono ndo lo rosa ngabula karua. Bula bina kwa Suzy. Bula bina kwa Tarisi. Bula bina kwa everyone. <laughs> Very nice. I love your flower and you look beautiful today. Thank you. And happy Women's Day to everybody out there. Yes, Avinaka. What's the weather like uh, in Nukulevu today, Suzy? Uh, it, it was beautiful this morning. It was nice and calm. I was able to get a swim. But now it's changing a bit. It's uh, a bit windy and I think it's going to rain, which is welcome because we always need water here. Yes. Uh, oh, that is so nice. Vinaka, Vinaka Wakalevu for joining me today. And I was so uh, stoked when you agreed to uh, my humble request uh, coming mm -hmm. all the way from Hawaii. So Vinaka Wakalevu, Susie, for uh, spending some time with us this evening, uh, just to tell and all with us and, and share some of your inspirational journeys that you've taken, uh, you know, ever since you were a little girl growing up uh, in Fiji. Um, so maybe um, to kickstart our Talanoa, if you would like to, just to introduce yourself to us, if that's uh, uh, possible, Susie, uh, your uh, Koro, Korinivasu, and the place where you were raised, Nak. Okay. Thank you, Tarisi. Um, I come from a family of four sisters, and my father was born and uh, raised in Kandavu in his formative years, and then moved to Levuka when he was 10. Uh, my mom is from Vangandadi, uh, Ovalau, and that's where I was born and raised until I was 16 and uh, went to New Zealand to complete my secondary education. Yes. Um, yeah. Wow. So the or Ovalau was your home then, eh? Yes, it was. Wow. What was the, your memories of growing up in, uh, in, on the island of Ovalau or in Vangandavi or memories of Levuka? I remember in, uh, growing up in Levuka, my dad, my dad had a few businesses that he tried out and um, we had a, quite an outdoorsy upbringing. I think he, 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 he missed having a son, so he used to do things like go out fishing, go out trolling, we got to pull the anchor up for him and do all the boys' job. We'd go to the beach, we go hiking. So we had quite an outdoorsy uh, lifestyle in Levuka. Most children grew up in Levuka did it also, because we had the hills and we had the land and we had the ocean at our, at our feet, at our disposal. And it was quite, uh, it's the best time of our, my life actually growing up. Wow, mm. that is so nice to hear, Isa. And mm. um, uh, what school did you go to when, you know, when from, kindergarten or primary school? Yeah. So I started kindergarten in 1971 at uh, the Levuka Town Hall and yeah. continued on to primary school at Maris Convent School and then on to St. John's College in Dawadi. Um, then I did a stint of uh, boarding in my final year, final term of fifth form. And then sixth and seventh, I completed in New Zealand. There was all Catholic school. The school in New Zealand was uh, an all-girls Catholic boarding school. Uh, I was getting a bit restless in high school in Fiji and getting into lots of trouble with the nuns. And, and so my mom thought someone had told her in uh, the Ovalau Club over a beer that this school, Baradine, would, uh, you know, you, you go in and you come out a lady. So my mother said, oh, that's the school for Susie to go to. So that's how I ended up going overseas. 
Uh, so you mentioned about the nuns. So what were some of your the mischiefs that you were part of, uh, if you can remember? Um, I, I'll tell you the last one. The last. <laughs> I think people know this one. Um, you know, in boarding school, uh, you know, half past nine is lights out. And uh, the kids, the, the uh, students are always daring each other to do something. And I remember a friend of mine, uh, Margaret Kutuisuva, daring me to play my guitar down the corridor with my undies and my bra on, just that. And so I did. And halfway down the corridor, I just they walked in and, and she made me sit at the foyer till midnight. And sister had a room in the convent and she also had a room at the end of the corridor in the hostel where we slept. So while I was sitting in the foyer on the cold hard floor, this Lyra saunters in, a land crab comes in and sister just popped into the convent at that time. So of course, into my head popped the devil and I picked this uh, Lyra up and I put it in sister's bedspread. And so it was about 10 to 12 that time and 12 o'clock, she said, okay, you may go to bed now, Liza Lee. She'd call me Liza Lee or Doris Day. And so my room was about, say 40 meters from her bedroom. But before I got to my room, I heard one big Kyla from sister's room when she got in. And <laughs> so the next morning, sister put me on the back of the Tavia truck with my suitcase and she called my mother and she said, your daughter Susie is, on the back of the caviar truck and don't send her back. So that was the end of my uh, boarding stint in St. John's College and how I, my mother started looking for a school in New Zealand to go to. It was easy in those days because the Fijian currency was very strong, artificially very strong against New Zealand. I remember changing 500 Fijian dollars back in 1983 and getting 910 New Zealand dollars. So I guess it was affordable for my parents to send me to boarding school in New Zealand then. Uh, I, I couldn't afford to send my children now. Mm. Mm, so, uh, I'm just getting lots of uh, uh, responses about the Lairo incident. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bulvinaka to all the ex uh, St. John the Wavi, and I know those of you who were boarded at that time would remember some of the mischiefs you all did. So, uh, yeah. Susie just uh, confessed to one of the many, uh, but I think one is enough, eh, Susie? Maybe I tell another one. Uh, we had two, uh, two girls in our, along our corridor, and they had brothers that were, had played in the team. And one of them was uh, uh, Severo Korundundu and his sister. His sister was boarding with us and Asen and Dirambe was boarding with, her, with us and her brother was, uh, who is that guy? Uh, Paolo Ruto, I think. He was a captain of, uh, of one team. So anyway, the, the rugby would be on and we'd all be in somebody's cubicle with a radio. And then sister, sister comes in and my room was sort of on the corner. So, so Mbulo Wangadimbao, whose brother is Severo Korundundu, hid under my bed and she's quite uh, hippie. She's, got, she's, quite, she's quite big and our beds are quite low. So her backside was sticking my bed up. Now she's trying to lie straight and she was moving under my bed hiding. <laughs> so yeah, that's another funny story. <laughs> <laughs> so so the so the the sisters there eh, the, the nuns must be you know must be really talking among themselves uh, well, there's something happening in the dorm nearly every day and one name must be keep popping up eh? <laughs> no wonder no wonder you went a uh, eh, one way trip from St John back home on the Tavia truck Tavia truck and those days we didn't have wheels on our suitcase it was those big bulky one size and you have to carry it so we're talking about 1982. Wow. So 40 years ago. <laughs> 40 years ago. Wow. It's a, what a wonderful way yeah, to go down memory lane. And uh, uh, I think uh, going back, you know, spending time to think of our childhood, I think uh, it's, it's, it's good for us to do eh? uh, because we live such a, a very busy life, uh, but we have moments like this, just to think back of our childhood. Um, there's so much beautiful memories, Sebada. 
Of course, uh, Karisi. Sa totoo ko ba kawati, man. Iyon, nilip sa comment chuk ming gore, babit bin nakatak chuk may, one even mentioned that the Lairo ended up in New Zealand. I think it did went to New Zealand, that Lairo that you talked about. Ita ko bin ako makalewo. And going to New Zealand, what was your experience there for the two years? Yeah, it was a real eye-opener. I, I, I got homesick at first, like most people. But then you just, you know, you acclimatize, you adapt. There was a lot to do. You had, you know, you had to, it's a whole new set of friends, new type of food, new culture, uh, new accent. I'd, I'd, I'd had trouble trying to understand people and people had trouble trying to understand me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but then uh, then at the boarding school, luckily, there was a few Fijian girls. So that made us, we could have sort of kept a very close-knit uh, circle of friends and helped each other when, you know, when it was needed. But otherwise, it, it, it was a, it's very nice. New Zealand's a nice place, nice people. Um, didn't like the cold so much, but it's, it's such a beautiful environment and, and so laid back at the same time. So those two years, that would have been a turning point for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So was it a stepping stone to university after that? Uh, it was. I ended up in, uh, going on to university in Auckland. A few of us, few of us did, but the others, Lavinia Kutshank ended up in Christchurch and Murray then Wellington, Murray the Rambuka. Um, uh, some some opted not to go to university, mm. uh, but yeah, university I would say would be the best years of my life because you there was nobody to nobody to force you to go to lectures, nobody to take take names and attendance. Uh, you were a student, but you had money in your pocket, and as an overseas student, you were allowed twenty hours of work. Uh, without a work permit, so I, I did that. I worked right throughout university, babysitting, working in bars, uh, pubs, restaurants, waiting tables. I did a lot of things. So, wow, that's really good to, <clears throat> to hear because these are some wonderful examples that even youths today eh, uh, can think about and, and sort of uh, compare to their situation. Uh, in which you're away from mom and dad, you're in a different country and you're studying, but also working, yeah, 20 yes. hours a week. Wow. Yes. That's so you're amazing. totally independent. You don't need to write to your parents for money. And then when I got to home, when I got to university, I had a bursary with government with, at Form 7. So the New Zealand government paid me a, a weekly allowance of, uh, I think it was $140 a week or so. So my parents didn't pay, have to pay for my university. Wow. Yes, uh, <clears throat> what a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, for you, eh? And support uh, yeah, less, less hassle or burden on mom and dad. Yes. Mm, so. yeah, they didn't introduce the user pay system until 1991, which is my last year at university. And uh, even then it wasn't that, that much. You know, you could pay, it was affordable. Wow. Sevenaka. And yeah, when you yeah. went to university, uh, what subject did you decide to, to choose to study? I, I, uh, geography was my favorite subject. So I did a BA in job, uh, actually I did a BA in geography majoring in English. And then I wanted to carry on to do a master's in geography. Mm -hmm. And that night, the night before I was supposed to fly back to New Zealand to enroll, I was having a a farewell party at, at Francis Bingo's house. And then I told them on well, my flight at six from now story and I had all this vele and, and uh, seafood frozen that my auntie had prepared and I was gonna take back to New Zealand. And then they were saying, oh, we got to sing you a farewell song. So they sang the Issa Issa about three times. So by the time we reached now sorry airport, the, the taxi, uh, the airplane was already taxiing on the runway. I missed the flight. Really? So, missed the flight. So, I got on the next day's flight to Auckland. 
and the dean for geography said that there's sorry there's no more office space left for master students but why don't you try town planning it's similar so that's how i ended up doing town and country planning studies and i worked with that for nine years with the government with the department of town and country planning and uh after that i moved on to the minister of tourism and did tourism planning for four years and then i left I left government, you know, once I felt like I was in a position to stand on my own and uh, wow. run my business. Uh, that's amazing. And even when you were still in uh, Levuka, uh, when you were young, did you have any sort of uh, a dream job uh, that you always wanted when you were little? Yes, I, I wanted to be a hairdresser. Yeah, I wanted, well, we all went from nine, I think we all wanted, all the kids in my class, all the specific girls, we wanted to become nuns. So all the time we change our clothes, we take our, take our t-shirt off and leave it up to here, so we look like we, you know, we were nuns. And then it was air hostesses after that. And then I think after that, I wanted to become a hairdresser. And I would uh, cut all my, my sister's dolls hair and assure them that the hair would grow back. And I'd cut their hair, then cut it again until they had no hair left. <laughs> and I would get into trouble with my mom for cutting the doll's hair. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> well, all those dreams, yeah, when we have when you were young, but you never know you ended up being a, a town planner. Um, yes. So when you were studying at the University of Auckland, uh, did you really enjoy uh, studying that uh, field of study? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think uh, because, you know, it's all about land settlement and making people's lives better through advocacy planning. And I, I think I got into the right field because you, it does mean that you don't sit at this for eight hours a day. It takes you out of the office doing inspections. It's just my type. I like being in the outdoors. So I, I don't think I could have been an accountant or something that would have to sit at the table for eight hours. Wow. a day so, so so doing something outdoors was something that was natural for you eh? yeah yes uh, wow and yeah i was i think i recalled uh, meeting you in one of uh, the um, meetings uh when i was at the fiji museum i think we were part of the Ndobata program there was something that uh, Alberti Bogiva, uh, i think was organizing at some point in the 90s so it's really nice eh, to see tourism, uh, Native Land Trust Board at the time, Department of Environment, uh, Forestry, Fiji Museum, National Trust. Yeah, it's really nice to see the collaboration uh, yes, at that yes. time. Uh, what, yeah, what were some of your memories uh, working for the government at that time, uh, Susan? Um, yeah, I would say it's, it's uh, when you leave university, it's good to join the government because you, you have a secure job, you, um, your, your networking is really, you get to meet a lot of people. Um, and uh, because we, we were considered third world, we get a lot of aid to further mm -hmm. education by other governments. So while I was in the government, I was able to go to Israel and study there for a month. And to Brisbane, the University of Queensland, and then the East West Center in Hawaii. Uh, and the, some of my memories are uh, revising the town planning schemes for Savo Savo Town, uh, Tavo Town and Rambi Island. So I'm happy that I've been able to make a change for these people and uh, uh, suggest the innovative ways for their towns to develop. Uh, Rambi was a, a challenge. It was you know, going out there in, uh, in the long hours and I had, I just had Josh, he was a year old. So I opted to take him to Rambi with me for my field, my field studies. And he would, I got to hide a babysitter to watch him while I did all my field work. Wow. And um, yeah, at the end of it all, uh, you know, I hope it's making a difference to the people's lives out there. Mm. Uh, were there other women working in the town planning uh, division at that time? At, at that time, there was Asinava. She was the city planner in the Suva City Council. 
and uh, Salita. And with, with me in town planning, there was Tessa and Racheli, the Kanasina, Lemba, Vaseva Lemba, uh, the women, uh, Nazra and Mrs. Umbital. Yeah, there was a good mm. lot of women. And uh, I mean, I remember I was studying and uh, uh, someone was saying about Canada, having 40% of their town planners were women in Canada. And uh, I think women bring a, a compassionate approach to any project that's, uh, you know, in the pipeline. Mm. Um, yeah, I just think that, that in planning, we, women are needed because we have different experiences and we have different opinions on things uh, regarding people's safety and comfort. Um, yeah, when it comes to town planning. Um. Oh, that's great. Like, uh, Susie, I'm sure there will be some, uh, you know, young girls listening in tonight. Um, what would be your advice to any of them who's interested to take, uh, you know, town planning as sort of like, you know, their career? What would be uh, at least just one advice you want to share with them just to encourage yeah. them? So if it's uh, for today, you know, go for it. Um, work hard at it. Always, you know, uh, take that extra mile with things. You know, that helps, especially with the civil service always having this town planning in Fiji is essentially a central service. Not many people go out and do it private because you can get free consultation from the council or the government. Mm. So, you know, if it's, if it's what you want and you enjoy it, go for it. Mm. And many of the courses are uh, offered overseas, mainly. To be a to be a town planner, the, you can do it in in uh, Fiji. I think you come out with a bachelor of land management. Right. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, most people go to Australia, New Zealand. Mm. So, uh, that's wonderful. So, for those of you listening in, uh, in terms of that career path that uh, Susie took, uh, there's land management courses eh, offered at USP. Uh, so that's an option that you can take. And uh, you mentioned Israel and you mentioned uh, East West Center and Brisbane, uh, but I know you've uh, visited uh, at least 47 countries. Uh, what yeah. was something that motivated you, Susie, to, to love to travel? I think uh, it was mainly uh, growing up in the backpackers. My parents opened uh, the old capital Inn in Lebuka in 1977. So this year, it, uh, it's 45 years old. And uh, it's just listening to travelers, you know, they talk about the, their travel plans and, you know, we can't help listening and asking questions. And so there's a combination of that, just listening to travel stories, uh, just my curiosity about the world. And uh, actually coming from New Zealand at that time, we had Student Travel Association and travel was very cheap. Mm -hmm. So that's when I first, uh, was one, you know, you, when you see other young people coming to your house as a traveler, you want to do the same thing. Yeah. Mm, so, wow. And also, not only you went to these 47 countries, your children as well has traveled uh, with you. I know Josh has been to 25 countries and Colin at uh, 24. Um, okay. what, what would be something you, uh, you would say to that as a parent and you were involving your children to travel with you? Um, it's just some, I think they inherited the travel bug from me. They love to travel too. And, um, you know, there's not many things that we can, you know, when we make money, we don't like go to wear fancy clothes or jewelry. Or we just like to spend our money on traveling. And to me, because we were in the tourism industry, it was like an indirect way of investing in tourism, taking my children traveling. Because then when travelers visit us, they have something to talk about. Um, they know the likes of people from, say, say Japan or, you know, they, Chinese people don't really like the sun too much. Uh, there's specific things about different cultures that they are aware of because they've traveled and they've lived amongst these people. They know what kind of food people like. They can tell accents apart, like, for example, accents between Australia, um, Australia, New Zealand, 
and America and Canada. Yeah, that kind of. So uh, this is lovely. I mean, it's like uh, they say, travel is um, is something that you spend that makes you richer, and money uh, spent that makes you richer. Wow. And it's very true because it broadens your mind. Um, yeah, I, I, it's important to, to have a broadened. Uh, Mm, so did, you know? I understand yeah. with uh, Josh and uh, and Colin, uh, was it a few years ago you went to Sri Lanka? Yes, uh, in 2020, we were there when the bomb, we just arrived a Saturday and Sunday morning was the bombing in Colombo. Mm. But luckily we were two, two hours south of Colombo. And Josh and Colin were enrolled in this program uh, at this turtle sanctuary. They did volunteer work, feeding the turtles, painting the place up, uh, changing the water, just, you know, helping out. And then while we were there, they released uh, 240 turtle hatchlings into the Indian Ocean. Mm. And that was a very emotional time for all of us. So, what a way eh, for them to enjoy uh, a different country, but at the same time uh, learning something, but contributing to uh, the country that they're visiting. That's really awesome for yes, young people to be taught. Is. Yeah. That's the way it is now. Like most young people, that's called volunteerism. And uh, we, oh. we were hosting volunteers, uh, uh, volunteers in Suva and the island. So I made an arrangement with a company from Britain if Colin and Josh could do one of the programs that was uh, in Asia somewhere that we would like to visit. So that they it turned out that they had a few available in Sri Lanka and it looked really good. So we chose the turtle project and that's how it happened. So when, when, when we have the volunteers on the island, the kids can tell the other volunteers too that they've done something similar, you know? Because it's all people their age. Wow. Oh, that is amazing. And travel is, uh, yeah, as you said, it, um, I really like what you said. It's something that makes you richer, even though yeah. some people may look at how much you spend, uh, but it's not just the spending. Yeah? It's uh, what you get out of it. Yeah, what you get out of it. Yeah. Ah, that's really yeah. wonderful. Um, so you mentioned um, tourism and uh you are into that uh, business in tourism. Would you like to share a little bit about uh, your, your vision and what you're doing right now? Because I know you are in uh, Nukulevu right at this very moment. Yes, yes I am. Wow. Yeah. So what, what is your vision? Because uh, I know you also have a colonial, uh, colonial lodge in Suva. Um, yeah. You know, it's just so wonderful when you come into your home, home in Suva. Uh, you know, in the middle of uh, the hustle and bustle of the city, you know, you have your space, you know, in the colonial lodge. Um, and now you also have the business for your dad in Levuka. Uh, what would you like to share about the inspiration from your dad? Okay. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, most of you know that I'm now based in Levuka and I never in my wildest dream knew that I'd end up in Levuka until last year when my dad asked me to go, go over and have a look and help with the business. Mm. And uh, then I got on lockdown. And unfortunately, um, you know, just not like Suva, Suva just kind of fell by the wayside. It's impossible to be in three places at one time. Mm. Um, at the moment, Suva is run, run as a for long-term accommodation. We have uh, two tenants that stay They've been there for over a year or two. So it's more or less closed temporarily. Uh, and uh, on the island, um, I don't think people, a lot of people can afford picnics right now, especially, especially uh, since we've been in a pandemic for two years and it shows no sign of us returning to normalcy at all. Um, uh, but when you think about it, like the pandemic was quite beneficial for the island because it gave mm. it time to recover from, we've been here five and a half years and we've had like eight cyclones and mm. we've lost like a lot of shoreline, like five 
five to six meters of sand. So that two years of uh, non-activity, I think was quite beneficial environmentally for the island and not so much uh, for me and the church because uh, my tenants of the Catholic church and they've been very understanding mm. and offered me a grace period with the rent, which, uh, which, you know, takes away all the stress, unnecessary stress during a time like this. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, so I'm in Levuka. It's uh, nice to be there. It's nice to give back to the town. When I got there, I was quite shocked at the, the state of it. You know, it seemed like Levuka had been forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of our buildings are falling to dis disrepair mm -hmm. and our roads are terrible. But, you know, there are good things that are happening too. Like we have uh, the, the government putting up uh, rock armor seawalls around the mm -hmm. island. And it looks really good. And it, it, to me, it serves two purposes. It stops the water coming in. And it also allows people to be able to walk onto those rocks and be able to fish further. Because mm -hmm. when we were little, we were allowed to use the, the wharf in Lebuka and, and, and fish. But now the wharf is closed. They don't let people go onto the wharf to fish which is a shame because a lot of people don't have boats or can't afford fuel to go out fishing. So yeah. going to the wharf would, it, it would enable them to catch big fish rather than fishing off the seawall and catching all the undersized fish. Yeah. And um, yeah, so there are good things that's happening there. Uh, we recently just got a new special administrator who's a woman. And I think her input would be very valuable because she's, she came into to Levuka with fresh eyes, which is mm -hmm. English. Married a local, 20 years there. She knows everything about Levuka and, you know, um, there's people who've been in Levuka all their lives that helped and keep being our advisors there, like uh, Miss Sandys, uh, Bupendra, Miss Yoshida, and we have a very good CEO, uh, Mr. Rakuita. Uh, he does the best that he can, despite uh, having a very limited um, revenue source for the council. Then we have people who come back to Levuka and uh, given back, like uh, Mr. Naidu. Uh, there's a lot of people who have come back home and uh, contributing to the development of the town. Um, yeah, I'd say we seem like we've been forgotten. And I think once we, everybody's united and on the same page and have the same vision, then we can overcome what's happening right now with the state of the cultural heritage and the state of our uh, world heritage status. Right, absolutely, yeah, because that's a, it's a global recognition eh, that uh, Lubuk right, is right, a world yeah. heritage site. And, and then everyone has an obligation you know, to keep it that way, not just us, the Kai Lubuka, but everybody in all of humanity, really. Right, absolutely. Because Lubuka has got a very, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a very special place. Eh? Uh, yeah, so much uh, history, uh, yeah. colonial history, even before that, you know, even the, mm -hmm. during the prehistory of Fiji, uh, Oberlau plays such a very important uh, role as far as, uh, you know, butter system is concerned, as far as, um, you know, migration uh, from mm -hmm. Lomai Viti to Viti Levu and over to Bono Levu. So, yeah, let's hope. I'm sure your presence in Levuka um, can also, you know, bring a lot of benefits maybe to help those who are already there and get yeah, it, yeah. yeah, up and running again and, or just supporting what's already moving on the ground. Yes, yes, yes. Mm, yeah, I've been doing you know, several meetings that they have for the town and try and, you know, give back. And um, wow. yeah, like I said, we just need one voice. We need unity and uh, we've got the enthusiasm with the young, young folks especially. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we are assured that there's gonna be continuity of our legacy in Levuka with, through our children. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also if we can realize too that there's a lot of the uh, Levuka diaspora, right? Around the world. Uh, oh yeah. Yes, there's so many Levuka residents who are connected to different parts of the world. I'm sure if they listen to our Talanoa tonight, what would be something you would like to say to them as far as support and uh, um, supporting what the work is being happening in Levuka or the island of Ovalau as a whole, uh, Susie? Yeah, <clears throat> I think we've been forgotten. Like the, major, the main uh, 
uh, issue there is the lack of funding and the lack of money for people to keep the buildings up to par with what is required or generally just keep it maintained so it looks good and, and not falling to bits. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure about how it is that if people fundraise and send money, but I think it's going to happen that if uh, we don't get help soon, maybe the community will get together and do some kind of um, mm. a go, go fund me for, you know, to save the buildings in Levuka. And I think mm. a lot of them would be very willing to uh, fork out to a worthy cause. Mm. So. But in the end, that's, that's what's going to happen. Because, I mean, it's obvious that the government is lacking money as well. Jeez. Uh, for sharing that, Susie. So I'm calling over now to our past residents of Levuka, uh, those of you who are not from Ovalau, but from different other provinces around Fiji. If you went to Loreto, or if you go went to Levuka Public or St. John the Wadi, or have connections to Ovalau, uh, please consider uh, supporting yeah, this new movement uh, to help Levuka. And I think, uh, Susie, uh, the power of people, yeah? yeah, it's 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 powerful, you know. If when we have the community banding together and working together, we can make a huge difference on the ground. I say, yes, yes, definitely. Wow. So we uh, Susie for sharing that. Eh? So there's need help needed on the ground. And uh, those of you who are from Levuka who are listening in today, um, I'm sure there's the Levuka Heritage Committee, uh, also Mr. Rakuita, who's the CEO there, Ms. Yoshida and Sandy, uh, who are all working hard on the ground. Um, if there's anybody who has some wonderful ideas uh, who want to help Levuka, please get in touch with Susie um, or send me an email through my page and uh, I will be happy to facilitate or connect you with Susie and all our hardworking uh, <coughs> residents of Levuka, because many of them have been there for years. They've been working so hard mm -hmm. and trying to fundraise left, right and center, but we need more support. Yeah, we need more support yeah, to, help the work, yeah. Yeah, to help the work by the Department of Culture and Heritage. I know the Fiji Museum, they're doing their part. The National Trust is doing their part. Fiji Arts Council. But if we can all support and band together, wow, a huge difference. Because I can see, Susie, there's been a lot of wonderful examples I've been seeing in Asia. Uh, in the case of Thailand, in the case of Myanmar, um, you know, there's some, a lot of community support. Um, to help, you know, sustain yeah, a lot of our heritage sites because it is expensive and it's a big mm -hmm. expectation for the local residents uh, mm -hmm. to maintain their, their home to look like how it was 100 years ago. But for you mm -hmm. to maintain your house, it equals money. Yeah, yeah it mm -hmm. equals time and effort. So, yeah. So let's all work together and get this uh, support going. So we're not going to Yeah, it's just, uh, it was a bad, matter of bad timing too. Like we got inscribed into the World Heritage Listing in 2013. And then um, uh, Winston, Cyclone Winston happened 2016. And then the COVID. So it's just been bad luck for everybody. You know, so you can't really point fingers at anybody of why yeah, everything's yeah. so run down. Uh, we just need a lot of patience, a lot of cooperation, and lots of money. Yes, absolutely. So patience, cooperation, and definitely, yeah, the the finance, yeah, to help uh, make some of those dreams come true. That is so true. 2013, three years later, Winston, and then four years later, COVID. COVID. Yes, and it's still yeah. on. And it's still on. Saranga. So definitely uh, we will bend together and have a lot of focus here to be uh, moved towards uh, Levuka. For those of you logging in uh, from Levuka and Ovalau, uh, we really appreciate your support and patience. And uh, I'm sure our government departments are working their very best yeah, with the little uh, resources that they have. Um, it may be slow, but as they say, slow but sure we will get there and we'll get there together. All right, and Susie, you also mentioned about some of your dreams about the you know, marine uh, protected uh, areas. Uh, I remember you mentioned mm. about Zangelai and Leleuia, you know, with dead uh, being part of it way, way back. Uh, would you like to share a little bit about that vision of yours? 
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I got, I managed to get a lease on uh, this island, Nukulevu, in 2016. And when I, once I got here, I realized how environmentally sensitive the island was. So I tried to, I consulted fisheries and tried to see if we could make the island a, a marine protected area. And so um, we, we, we went and approached the chief, local chief here, and <clears throat> we just got the shock of our lives because we went in there not ex you know, expecting him to you know, give us what we wanted because it's a, it's a good course. But he came in in quite an angry mode and uh, you know, was thinking, what's, what's this all about? He's, he came into the room and said, you, you, you. Uh, then he, then he um, slammed his fist on the, on the floor and for my benefit as a woman and uh, English speaking, he spoke in English and he said, uh, I don't believe in this conservation bullshit. I just believe in the word. I believe in the book. I believe that he gave enough fish for everybody. Mm. And uh, so that was it. We were all stunned. And uh, the um, service we ended there more or less. Mm. And then I came home like, you know, quite uh, beaten quite sad actually for the province of Thailebu because it, he would have shown the way for other chiefs to take, you know, to do the same thing and protect the, their resources for the next generation. Because mm. if you see that this area around here, it's become like under a lot of pressure for development. Although they've promised that they'd fix the wharf, there's no, the development is becoming like, I don't know, hodgepodge kind of, you know, shanty, town style and Natovi Wharf. Right. Uh, government's meant to pump in 50 million, but that hasn't happened. But instead, we used to all these years just had one company, Patterson, servicing uh, over our residence between Nebuka and Vitilevo. And now we have three or four, four ferry services, 12 ships. And so each time they're starting up their propeller, it, you know, the silt comes up and then floats this way, depending on where the, the currents are. And then it's killing our reefs. The island facing Nakovi is the, it's all dead in the front. The back of the island is quite nice. The coral is quite pretty. But that's what's happened. Uh, it's become under a lot of pressure, this place. So the more so that, you know, we should protect it, uh, protect the island. And well, there's also fishermen that come around and using uh, underside, you know, nets that are two and three quarter inch in size when it's supposed to be four inches. So they catch everything and the little fish that they don't want, they just leave it floating in the island. And it's quite sad. There's nobody to fight for these, you know, to mm. fight for fish and fight for the trees and what's happening in our environment around here. Mm. And, um, and I just thought, you know, if I had been a man, would he have done that? Would that chief have done that? Mm. You know, he wouldn't, you know, I think because I was a woman that he was able to just come in and throw his weight around like that. Mm -hmm. And I just felt really uh, insulted by it. And I had quite, quite murderous thoughts. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> never mind. Yes, you know, so, hopefully. And then Josh mm -hmm. said, oh, mom, you know, his grandson, I went to university, with, uh, went to Maris with him. I said, okay, so we just have to wait for him to leave and then maybe you can negotiate the generation the yeah, <laughs> yeah the generation will do it we just have to uh, advise them and lead them <laughs> yeah, no, so what would be your your vision then for involving young people and i'm just so happy that josh and colin uh, your two sons have been really um instrumental in working with you uh, both in uh, Nukulevu and Col uh, Colonial Lodge, as well as the old capital in, in Lebuka. What would be mm. your, your, your vision for making more youths participate in the community level as far as conservation is concerned, Susan? <clears throat> yeah, I think there's more education definitely needed in the schools mm. and uh, involving the kids. Uh, right now, like uh, the sixth and seventh formers of Queen Victoria School, that's just across the bay from us. Yes. They come here on a half a day. You know, we provide the boat for them just so the kids can do a half a day of biology classes here. Nice. And I think our guest may follow suit later. Uh, for children, uh, Josh and Colin are pretty much, you know, um, you know, going around, bring up around me. Uh, pretty much uh, ambassadors for the fish and the trees and things that can't speak. 
but you know, as far as keeping them in the business, I can't really, I hope that they would. I'd actually hope that one of them would do accounting, but uh, Colin's into civil engineering and Josh is into carpentry and probably mm. he likes building homes. He likes making things nice. Mm. Um, and he also wants to go overseas. So I can't really stop them and expect them to follow suit and expect them to want to live in Nabucca or stay, remain in Fiji or remain on an island. Because sometimes being on an island, you here by yourself for weeks on end. You know, they, they, it's a good thing that they, they enjoy their own company and they like reading novels. Um, they go diving. They both uh, paddy certified, so it helps. Yeah, so they... they I can't stop them, you know, if they want to go and do something else, mm. I don't know what the history of the, our business will be because all our population, I have two nephews in uh, Florida working on super yachts, you know, and it's a very fab, uh, uh, fam life, I mean, a uh, flash life. They, you know, we, they got top of the range water sports and um, they eat the same food as the guests on the boat and they travel all over the Bahamas. And Josh wants to go and do that, and I can't stop him, you know. Mm. So uh, I, I'm just so so far. I'm just grateful for how it's been, you know, that mm. I've had them this long. Josh turned 24 yesterday. Mm. Colin is 20, and he's at home looking after guests and cooking breakfast and <clears throat> and complaining less. And uh, <laughs> he's mummy's boy. Wow. No, I just have to say, you know, on behalf of all of us, just wanted to acknowledge you, Susie, you know, as a mother, how you raised your boys so well. They're so well behaved, you know, and, and just to see them with you, you know, by your side, you know, we always see them with you wherever we see you. There's one of them there, you know, and I have to say, Susie, that, you know, I have my two children, too. You know, one is 23, one is 20. And um and the thing is, you know, when people see us with them, a lot of my friends only say, wow, this is really nice because my children left when they were 18, you know. So it's really lovely to see your two sons, you know, yeah. enjoying your company, Susie. What would you like to say to parents listening, uh, especially just spending quality time with your children? Yeah, I think it's a uh, time well invested. You know, these are the children, these are the ones who are going to... This, these are the ones you've lived for. These are the ones that made life worthwhile. And these are the ones that are going to look after you, maybe. Um, yeah, I guess just do a lot of, you know, it's a good investment to invest in your kids because you're on the same page. Like, I don't have to, I don't know, it's just different. I just, I just think uh, ch children who don't spend time, especially mothers with their sons, I think they miss out on a lot, you know? Mm. I think uh, they, they, uh, my kids, some, like uh, sometimes like uh, I, I'm mad with uh, something and they, they're there as your advisors. Yeah. Mm. So they're like your, your kids as well as your friends at this stage of life. They're also your best uh, friends yes. and, and loyal so can, friends. So they can be your, your sounding board. Eh? Sounding if you're getting board, really yeah. angry yeah. about something, they might say, mom, just calm down. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's really nice. You know, it's the training and I'm sure, you know, they'll become adults and they're running their own family, uh, but I'm sure they will um, remember yeah, the upbringing. I really like the word investment, you know, yeah. having children and spending time with them is our investment for them. Mm. Ah, yes. Susie and Vinaka Josh for being there and being a uh, mom's uh, Zoom coordinator. And I'm sure <laughs> Colin is uh, listening in too. Colin, uh, mom is happy you're complaining less. Vinaka <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, And now, in terms of, um, uh, I really like we, you know, our conversation this morning. Uh, Susie, you mentioned a comment. This it went like this. You said we need to slow down and walk back into the future. That was a really lovely comment you said when we were having our talano this morning. Um, especially when we are looking at our environment, we're looking at uh, you know conservation. You're looking at ecotourism um, yeah. and also <clears throat> thinking about what's happening now during this COVID nineteen time. Um, what was COVID like for you? Uh, and the boys, um, uh, and what were some of the plus, pluses that you experienced, Susie? 
during this COVID yeah. Uh, lockdown? Yeah, I think we were affected like a lot of lot of uh, families. We had all our eggs in one basket, in the tourism basket, and which was the segment that got affected the most. Um, I'm very grateful for my sister who lives in the States. I think during the COVID, I think everybody in Fiji was grateful for having a relative or two in the United States. They kept this, really, they kept this country running. All the hardworking women and men doing caregiving in the States. Um, uh, remittances became very much on the top of our income, foreign income um, into Fiji. Um, but environmental wise, I think COVID was good that it slowed down um, development. People were saying, you know, you saw on Facebook, dolphins in the canals in Venice and all that, birds in the extra birds in the trees and everything just turning pristine overnight. Now that was good. I think that's, you know, that's really good that um, it happened because things get, have a chance to heal um, but I think for us in Natovi, it's been unfortunate that they've moved Natovi to be the center of all passenger ships going to Vanolevu from Vitilevu and Ovalau and Poro. So there's a, a lot of pressure on our coastline here. Whenever it's high tide and the ship passes close to the island, we get the impact of the waves hitting against the shore. Mm. And uh, to me, we haven't, in terms of, you know, specific situation like how we in Natovi, not maybe not the rest of the Fiji in rest of Fiji. I mean, development is still slow in Levuka. But in Natovi, for example, having 12 ships when we just traditionally had one or two, wow. and that's put a lot of uh, stress on us. And I think, you know, we need to look at it. Government needs to maybe move some of the ferries north into Ellington or will come and fix this ferry and make sure that there's a planning scheme so that, you know, we don't have this haphazard um, and development that's happening now on the jetty. Right. Um, yeah, I just feel that, uh, you know, they make a decision saying, well, we're going to move this whole operation to Natovi without investing in Natovi and making sure that it's environmental because they've, mm -hmm. you know, for the last 10 or so years, we've been paying environmental levies. We don't know what, what happens to that money. What does it get spent on? Can it come and fix the wharf in Natovi or fix the wharf in Levuka or something? Mm -hmm. But that's what's happening. There's development, but no backup plan and no no real um, uh, <clears throat> uh, thinking of the repercussions, you know. So we're uh, not for uh, mm. for sharing that, and I'm sure um, you know with, with uh, post COVID, I hope that uh, you know things will get better, uh, particularly in your area of tourism. Um, mm. Your market is the backpackers eh? uh, and ecotourism. Um, guess, yeah. 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 So what's what's your vision now um, uh, when the tourist comes back and what would be your view of, of uh, Nukulevu? Um, I think some of our visitors may want to know where Nukulevu is. Would you like to tell our, our listeners? Yeah, uh, Nukulevu is just uh, 2.5 2 kilometers from Natovi Jetty to east, eastwards mm -hmm. towards Ovalau. So if you're on the ferry to Ovalau, you look on your right, you'll see this tiny island with white sandy beaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, my vision for it, like, it's definitely because it's environmentally sensitive. We've been working on the island in uh, like places that are sub, um, susceptible to erosion mm -hmm. with taken the footpaths it's called it's called site hardening where you protect an area people come in the footpaths won't go close so people are not going to be walking on the edge of the island anymore they'll be walking more inside mm -hmm. and also if you think of the carrying capacity and its effect on the island probably doing less picnics or less number of people coming in during the trips mm -hmm. yeah we've got to think of all that because otherwise it's uh, no point it's much better if we just left it alone mm -hmm. But so. right now, I just feel like uh, it's not more of an investment. I'm just quite happy. I feel like I'm the steward of the island. I look after it, so. you know. There's, it didn't have that care in the, in the, before I, we came onto this place. It was pretty dirty. A lot of the original hardwood trees, the mar mar maritime species have been taken off the island. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of nawa nawa here. Nawa nawa is used for carving of um, tanoas and Fijian artifacts. 
a lot of it's been taken off the island and sold to carvers over the years. Wow. Mm. And so we really planting you know, them? Yeah, so we've been, I think the, the only uh, salvation for this island would be to plant more mangroves to save the shoreline. Right. At the moment, we're trying to imitate what's happening in Ovalau and doing a rock armor seawall as well, especially in front of where the, our house is built. Right. Yeah. And um, yeah, just hopefully there's less, you know, if the, if the oceans are healthy, then I think our storms would be less frequent and less uh, um, harsh. We've right. been getting really powerful storms. And I think that's all an indication that the, the, the sea is not healthy. People are taking all the small fish, the big fish are taken, all the dairo, the seafood. Um, I think in uh, Vanuatu, they say there's no more tree left, no more uh, beach to left because it's all been taken. And that's very important for, for cleaning the, they're the sort of filters of the ocean. So it's very important not to take all the dairo. I haven't walked around the island yet because I've just come back to the island after a year. And I haven't been around because at the back of the island we have a lot of dairo, so I just have to see how what the stocks are. And whenever we go Vina Lyro, we mark it on our calendar and how many we caught and when was the last time we went. So we try and keep um, abreast of uh, all the resources we have. We, we have everything here: just Gawaki, Tandruku, a lot of Vivili, uh, Ngolea, and a lot of fish because of the mangrove. Wow. It is amazing. I really yeah. enjoyed what you said before, Susie, about education, because eh? I asked you the question about youths. You know, how would we involve our young ones? And uh, uh, you mentioned that QVS comes in half a day, uh, bringing the students in. I think that's a really, really wonderful program. And I'm sure yeah. if, uh, you know, schools that are nearby, uh, including Telugu North and Ratakanda uh, Bulevu School, Gore Saranga, eh? make the uh, that is a wonderful if we take the education angle um, there will be a lot of opportunities for our young Fijians who will be future leaders of uh, of our country to come in and learn about these things that you've just mentioned um, um, I'm sure uh, for those of our friends who are listening in, if we can support you and your two boys, you know, to get some education program going, that will be amazing. Exactly. You know, that'll be amazing. I can be able to champion something from here, you know, to well, organize some, yeah, yeah, organize some educational programs. And I even get asked here in the US, uh, here in Hawaii, you know, for a lot of our Hawaiians always enjoy exchange programs. Uh, um, any opportunity, this was long before COVID, and uh, any chance for us to go to Fiji, and even my university have been talking to me, uh, if I can be able to bring my students every summer, you know, to Fiji. Oh. So if, yeah, so if there's something that we can work on together, for Nukule can be the education, you know, yes. venue <laughs> for conservation, that will be amazing. And there's lots of funding for that too, Susie. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. yeah, so let's talk after this and see yeah. what we can do. Yay! So we can be able to, you know, uh, help you continue your business, um, you know, and you can get funding to help the environment of Nukulevu and of course the education stream that comes in, eh? especially climate change is such a big uh, a theme that everybody talks about. And of course it comes with funding support. So uh, that'll be amazing for, for Fiji. So wow, uh, Susie, for being a champion for business, a champion for tourism. And in this case, you know, you're talking about conservation and I can tell by your sharing, you know, you speaking from the heart, you know, you really know, know within you that it's really important that our future of Fiji, our youths, our young ones, they need to be educated. Um, and to be reminded <clears throat> that conservation is still a very key part of uh, keeping our environment uh, safe uh, and also for our future generation. Man, thank you so much, Susie. Um, anything else you would like to share with us tonight that we've missed out in discussing? Mm. Mm. 
not, not really. I think we covered basically everything. Mm, yeah, uh, you know, thankful for all the women around us. We make we make the world go round. Without us, the world won't go round. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, just so grateful. Yeah. Wow, very nice. I'm gonna share some of the the photos that you sent me. Uh, maybe we can talk to it before we uh, conclude. Talanoa. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. So I think this is the picture in the sofa. Yeah, that's in the sofa. That's my students at US from USB and took them for a trip to Ovalau. Wow. And they're sitting on the session stone. Mm, so. Yeah. Our session so, stone is one site that needs some some work because it got it was subject to some erosion. Yeah. So we need to build up a whole seawall for that. And, wow. mm. Okay. So there you go. For those of you listening in, uh, as well as our uh, past Lebuka residents who are living overseas, I think we can call uh, to some action on uh, you know putting together maybe a group internationally to support um, you know the uh, the maintenance if I can call it eh? the heritage maintenance of some mm. of these places especially in Asova which takes us back to October 10th 1874. Uh, this is a historical site and therefore it is not only the Levuka residents I think it's all the Fiji residents who can come together and help um, fundraise for the maintenance of this site. Um, so we're not about level Susie and also education. Eh? It's nice that we were just talking about education, and here you are walking the talk already, bringing your students from USP um, mm. to uh, Levuka. So again, um, acknowledging that part. Uh, here, there's a beautiful picture here of you and Dad. Uh, there, what what's happening oh, here? And my sister. That was my dad's 80th birthday, and that's mm. my older sister, uh, Clara. Mm. Uh, wow, we just want to acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, really want to acknowledge uh, your wonderful dad for yes. um, he played such an important role, right? In, in business life, and in the, yeah, in the life yeah. of my whole family and my children. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for those of you listening in, uh, Mr. Emosi Shaw has been in the Field of tourism for how long, Susie? Uh, for 45 years. Wow. Yes. Uh, and what a wonderful example eh, that uh, he has yeah, left he behind is, yeah. for you. He's always and wanting to, always of uh, service to the people. Yes. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, really, really, uh, you know, most of us really miss him. Uh, especially his jokes. Uh, oh. He always make us laugh whenever we uh, have a catch up with him. So again, a big vinaka uh, Susie mm -hmm. acknowledging that for his contribution to Fiji mm -hmm. um, and especially the field of ecotourism. Um, mm -hmm. What about this picture here? Well, that's, <coughs> that's when we went, uh, you, you were supposed to, maybe you took that picture. I think I took that's this picture. Caledonia. At the French ambassador's house in New, Cal in New Mayor. Yes, uh, yeah. And would you like to share what role you were playing uh, at that time as well? Uh, I think yeah, I was the secretary of uh, ICOMOS, which is the uh, International Committee on Monuments and Sites. Uh, it's, you know, uh, ICOMOS was the advisory body to UNESCO on uh, cultural heritage issues. Wow. Yeah. And that was a, a meeting we attended in uh, in New Caledonia. Yes. Uh, wow. See, so there you go. The conservation and uh, it, environmental care has always been there with you. Oh, and yeah. uh, there yeah. your role with Ipomos was uh, by, of course, wasn't an accident. Uh, Andy Mary Ratanombombua in yeah. green, um, you know, such a, a champion of heritage. And uh, she saw something in you, right? She saw that right. you will be the Ecomos champion and Tuliana here will be the Pima champion. So it's really nice to see mm. our Fijian women uh, contributing in different ways, eh? Mm. Mm. And then also here we have some of your pictures uh, of your travels. This one? 
Oh, that's with my cousin Kathy and her children in Brisbane. That was a Korean restaurant. You know, they bring the meats out and then you cook in front of you. They cook in front of you. It's really yummy, like a Korean barbecue restaurant. Right. Yes. Yeah. Again, travel, right? Travel is part of your uh, of your life. It's just so yeah. admirable. Uh, 47 countries, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And your travel, the travel bug is still there with you? Of course. I mean, I would like, love to see the other 153, but I don't think it's possible at my age. <laughs> you need two lifetimes, I think, to see the world. But again, a big vinakavakalevo to you as a mother, uh, and including Josh and Colin with you. You know, Josh, 25 countries and Colin, 24. So yeah. I'm sure uh, Josh and Colin will always remember um, hanging out with you. And I remember too, when we went to Samoa in 2010. Yeah. Right. Uh, we travel over to those island of Apolima and... Uh, Manono. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that was very memorable. I remember you we were singing some pigeon songs in the boat uh, 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 while we were uh, sailing. Eh? So yeah. again, remembering the two boys uh, traveling with you. And this one? No, that was in Sacramento. We had gone to my sister Veronica, her 50th birthday in the States. Mm. So the three of us, we went up. Uh, that was 2013. Mm. Uh, that's mm. eating pizza somewhere in old Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is amazing. And this mm. one here. And that's my cousin uh, Tugan and my good friend K Kat in Brisbane as well. That's uh, long. We were just going to do a a mangrove boardwalk, I think. Ah. Yeah, somewhere in Brisbane where you could do a boardwalk. Mm. Yeah. So, wow, that's amazing. And this is yeah. just, uh, to those of you listening in, this is just a, a snippet of uh, us peering into Susie's uh, world of travel. And uh, there's more, uh, but this is just enough for us today. But uh, as I always say to our guests, especially for you, Susie, you still have a lot of stories to share. And, um, you know, I will be happy to invite you again sometime in the future uh, to carry on with our Talano session because you're such an inspiration uh, to many of us women, uh, not only in Fiji, but around the world. You know, your tenacity and your determination, you know, to carry on with life and work uh, with all the trials that you come across, you continue, you know, you keep going. You still see Susie walking up and down, going on the boat, uh, doing things. So, um, what, what what makes you continue to do things despite all the trials? That would be a nice question to ask you, especially since this is a Women's History Month. I guess it's just uh, you know you got to keep going because you still have kids, you still have uh, bills to pay, uh, and also you see your parents did did the same thing. Because I come from my both my parents are very hardworking people. And uh, you always see them moving. They don't complain when my father used to make things out of nothing, you know, he'd repair things. It might seem um, hodgepodge, but, you know, it served the purpose. Yeah, we just learned from, from I, I guess you, you do what you, you, you're used to seeing, you know? Yeah. Uh, and also when you, when you have a, a, a business and you want it to be successful, you're obviously very driven yourself. I don't know what drives you, but you know, you're driven. Yeah, just uh, the fact that you don't want, it's your baby. When you're in business, you have to marry it virtually. Uh, you, you don't want it to fall. So these are all the things you have to do is just keep trotting along and, and, uh, and hope for the best. So that is amazing. That is amazing. Nakabaka yeah. with such a, um, a very empowering, yeah? Um, um, sharing you've just share, shared there, you know, you just mm -hmm. keep going. And uh, as you said, uh, as well, you know, you keep, you learn as you go as well, right? You uh, will not experience anything if you don't do it. Eh? Yeah, uh, yeah. But at the Maram, you know, they may be just thinking or dreaming, oh, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do this. But what I see with you, you think of something, you do it. If it works, that's good. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, mm -hmm. stand up and keep going. <laughs> Well, it must be because I'm from Kandavu. <laughs> Could be my, my Kandavu trait. 
Gar saranga. So that must be the Kantavu Trete. For our Tavu mm. listening in, I'm sure they might be uh, saying something else, but uh, yeah, that's a Kantavu power. <laughs> <laughs> To bring us to the end of our Talano session tonight, um, I will give you the time now to um, acknowledge uh, those who supported you uh, from when you were young, uh, growing up and uh, studying overseas and coming back and contributing to Fiji and you still contributing to Fiji. Um, there are some people who helped you along the way, uh, give you the time now to say a few words. Yeah, I must, um, you know, I've, I've, to be, I think I've been very, very fortunate and very lucky in life. I've had good friends uh, during the, the COVID. I had a lot of friends help send me money. One one of my friends, Susan, even sent me part of her FNPF, which she just got. Uh, and when I started my business earlier, in the beginning, I had a lot of help from Mrs. Gaetan Austin from uh, from uh, Pure Fiji. Uh, my friend Sangeeta Maharaj gave me a lot of her stuff. She bought houses and renovated them and she'd give me her doors and windows. And, you know, like my tree house in Suva is, is all windows from Sangeeta's old house in Lamy. Wow. And uh, there's people who gave me encouragement, you know, verbal encouragement, like Benedict Ngani Lau, my good friend Christoph uh, Dumar. And um, of course, people I worked with in government, and actually meeting you and Nandi Mary, um, I think the, the biggest influence in my life would, would be my dad. I think I'm very, mu very much like him. Uh, you know, he's showed us a lot and he's been one, he's a very successful, he's got the Midas touch with everything. Anything he touches, people just gravitate towards him. He's like, a, uh, you know, he's like a magnet for people. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, yeah, I've met a lot of very influential women. I can't name them all. I'm very grateful to my two sisters that are still living, uh, Veronica and Clara, all my family. Uh, my, my sons especially who have helped me um, to the Archbishop for having the, the um, you know, believing in me and giving me the, the lease for the island. Um, uh, the people of Levuka, um, there's a few, the, shopkeepers that gave me credit to do renovations on our home and they hardly knew me but they you know gave me credit in their hardware shop and little things like that mm -hmm. yeah all my friends from school primary secondary and university and who i'm still in touch with you know you know who you are um yeah again i've just been very happy very surrounded by a good bunch of people and i've been very lucky in my life and i'm very grateful for that mm -hmm. so Wow, ah, beautiful. Vinaka, Vinaka, Vinaka Vakalev Suzy. And Tao Mary just logged in and, oh no, she was listening, <laughs> but she mentioned, uh, she just said hello, I think, yeah, on here. Vinaka Tao Mary, uh, Vinaka <laughs> for joining in. Uh, and so it's just so beautiful to um, have her listening to and acknowledging your skills and your yeah. talent, Suzy. Eh? Um, she she calls yeah. me tourism Suzy and I call her culture Mary. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's why she's got an email. Her email address is culturemary at hotmail.com, I think. Yeah. <laughs> if I remember her email. Sorry, Tau Mary, yeah. I mentioned your email uh, publicly, but I'm sure I will be the one who will email you after this. Uh, but it's just so, so encouraging uh, because I will be interviewing Mele Wakolo, her daughter, tomorrow, Susie. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Oh. But she's another young up and coming, you know, uh, entrepreneur, businesswoman, you know, she's so creative and uh, she's amazing as a young mother and doing so well in business. Mm -hmm. Susie. <laughs> yeah. Because you are now the role model to the Susie, you know, for a lot of our young mothers out there and young girls. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, for joining me tonight. I really appreciate uh, your time. Um, yeah. And so I wish you all the very best uh, for the remaining part of this year. Uh, if I come over to Fiji, definitely I will bring myself to Nukulevu. If there's no boat there, I'll swim, swim to you. You'll swim, okay. That's lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Teresi, for the opportunity.
Peace. We're not going to be able to do it with Josh and Colin. And congratulations on your American uh, citizenship. Peace. We're not going to be able to do it with Josh and Colin. And Thank when you me. come over to the US, we'll definitely host you here in Hawaii. We would love that, for sure. Okay. Love All Hawaii. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. so take care and love Thanks to so everyone. Much, yeah. Bye, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Thank uh, you. So to those of you listening in, what a wonderful interview. Yeah, we've just had with Susie Isho. Uh, she's actually logging in from a beautiful island home uh, on the island of Nukulevu, just off the, the jetty of Natovi. So uh, if you are going over to Ovalau, you just look across to your right. There's a beautiful island there. And uh, it's just so nice to hear that the students of QVS are going over to Nukulevu as part of their biology class. But today uh, we are looking at, you know, maybe more schools to go to Nukulevu. And, uh, you know, that can be one way where we can support uh, Susie and her two boys, her two sons, Josh and Colin, um, in doing uh, conservation education, because it's such an, a very important um, a uh, topic that affects not only Fiji, but globally. But if Fiji and Nukulevu uh, and Ovalau and Televu are doing their bit uh, in supporting this beautiful island, then definitely we'll have a lot of young up and coming leaders who will be conservation focused or conservation driven because conservation is such a very important part of our life. Money is important, but conservation is just as equally important because what we keep today is what we will keep for our future um, uh, and our future generation. Okay, so we're not going to leave everybody. Uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful Talano session. Susie's making me really homesick right now, but um, mm -hmm. I'm glad I better go online and find my next flight to Fiji. Now that I can fly out, I'm really yeah. happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Susie. Okay, take care. Peace, uh, Naka. Naka, everybody, take care. And we'll see you in half an hour in which we will be traveling to big New Zealand. So from small New Zealand, we're going to big New Zealand uh, where we'll be talking to three nurses from Aotearoa. Naka wakalevu, nisa mwadamanta. See you later. Mwade. Mwade.